Hello! So in this video, we're going to build something that's a little bit of a gimmick. We're going to build and program an Arduino Uno to perform real-time voice repitching and music repitching. So yes, by the end of this video, I could sound like a chipmunk. So the first thing we need to be able to do is get some kind of analog signal out from the Arduino. The problem is, the Arduino doesn't actually have any analog outputs. Now I'm sure some of you at this point are shouting, what about the analog write function? Well that doesn't actually set an analog voltage. Using analog out on one of the digital pins produces a PWM, that's pulse width modulation signal, which would average out to be that voltage level. If we tried to use that with the audio, we'd just end up with a buzzing sound. So instead, we need a digital to analog converter, and there's several ways we can do this. But we're going to look at one of the most basic methods, and here's how it works. Supposingly we had a 4-bit signal that we wanted to convert to analog. 0000 would be 0 volts. 0001 would be 1 volt, 0010 would be 2 volts, and so on, all the way up to 1111 which would be 15 volts. So if we take one of those, as an example, to understand how binary works, 0000 would be 8 times 0 plus 4 times 0 plus 2 times 0 plus 1 times 0 equals 0. 1111 would be 8 times 1 plus 4 times 1 plus 2 times 1 plus 1 times 1. 15. So if we could build a circuit where the most significant bit could add 8 volts, the next 4 volts, then 2 volts, and the least significant bit could add 1 volt, then we should be able to end up with a combination that would give us the voltage we need. The circuit we're going to use is called an R2R ladder, and it looks like this. Because of the line of resistors shown in red, and the interconnections with the resistors shown in green, this circuit will do exactly what we want. The value for R can be anything, but not too small, as this would cause a higher current to flow. There's another type, called a binary weighted digital to analog converter, but this requires finding lots of different resistor values, which I don't happen to have to hand. So let's get that wired up on an Arduino Uno and take a look. Now, with the Uno, I'm going to use digital pins 0 to 7. I'll explain why in a minute. With 8 pins, this will be an 8-bit digital to analog converter. Looking at the output of the R2R ladder, you'll see I've connected a small amplifier which has a speaker connected to it. And here it is, wired up to the Uno. I was having a problem with poor connectivity with all those resistors, so instead I made a little adapter board that plugs directly into the Uno. Before we start messing around with recording audio, we need to test the digital to analog converter actually works. As for the code, to test this out I'm going to have the Arduino generate a triangle wave. It's very easy to do, it's just two loops, one increasing in value and the other decreasing. You'll notice in the code I'm not using direct write for each of the individual pins. Well, on the Arduino Uno, digital pins 0 to 7 are what's called port D, and rather than write all of those pins individually, we can use the special port D register to set them all in one go. This is much faster, and also ensures they're all set at the same time. Uploading the sketch, we can hear it in the speaker. Here's a picture of what the oscilloscope is picking up. See how you can actually see the individual voltage level changes as the Arduino counts through the possible output voltage levels. In reality, we don't want that though, as it'll cause a small distortion in the audio. So we can filter out those steps and smooth the waveform by adding a capacitor to the output. This acts as a filter, and as you can see, smooths the signal just as we'd expect. OK, so we can produce a simple signal on the output. Now we need to capture some audio. This time, we'll design the circuit first. It's actually quite simple. We'll take a signal in from a standard jack plug through a capacitor to block any DC component, and then using resistors, we'll offset and center the signal to float around 2.5 volts. The output of this will feed into the Uno's analog pin A5. The small 6.8 nanofarad capacitor is to filter out any unwanted high frequency sounds. Onto the code. Well, the first version looks like this, simply using the analog read command. Problem is, this command isn't very fast, and the output is also between 0 and 1023. And at most, we'd probably get a sample rate of around 3 kHz, which would be terrible. We're going to manually reprogram the analog to digital converter inside the Arduino to operate at a much higher frequency. We do this by adjusting the prescale value used to trigger the converter. This pattern of 101 written to the Arduino causes the system clock, 16 MHz, to be divided by 32. Now I know what you're saying. 16 MHz divided by 32 isn't 38 kHz. Well, the Arduino takes about 13 clock cycles to actually perform the conversion. So this actually works out to be 16 MHz divided by 32 divided by 13, giving us 38,461 Hz, or approximately 38 kHz. 
The next setting we're going to change is to ask the Arduino to continuously run this conversion and update the ADCH register so we can just query it when we want it. If you remember, the analog to digital converter on the Arduino is actually 10 bit, but we only want 8 bit, so we configure the ADCH register to only give us the 8 most significant bits. Finally, once a new value has been captured, we're going to ask the Arduino to generate an interrupt for us. The main reason for using this interrupt is so we get samples at precise intervals, and that can happen independently from what we're doing in the main loop. In our interrupt, we're going to take this sampled value and write it to port D. This should allow us to listen to what's being played. And here it is, all wired up on my board. So let's test that out. I'm going to play a piece of music, and then you can hear what the speaker is outputting. To prove it's coming through the Arduino, I'm going to press the reset button. Great, that appears to work. So how about this re-pitching thing? I guess we'll need to look at some theory first. So imagine we're recording the audio and at the same time playing it back. Some of you might just say, well, can't we just speed up or slow down the playback? Well, yes and no. If we speed it up, then we'll end up with gaps in the audio. This would happen because the output is playing faster than the input, so we'll run out of audio. If we slow it down, then we end up with more audio than we started with, meaning the delay between the input sound and the output will gradually get longer and longer and longer. So instead, we record a very tiny amount of audio and keep re-recording over the same piece. At the same time, we play this piece of recording over and over again. When we want to increase the pitch of the output, we start playing the recording faster. And if we want to lower the pitch, we slow down the playback. But because we're constantly looping this same block of sound, the actual audio that you hear is exactly the same length. The downside of this approach is the playback position occasionally will cross over the recording position, and you'll get a small glitch in the sound. But we'll not worry about that. Professional systems employ all sorts of tricks to get round that, and if you're not doing the re-pitch in real time, then the software can be really clever to fix that. So let's see how we can implement that in code. First, we create a very small buffer, in this case 512 bytes. You'll notice I've declared it inside the interrupt. Now we don't want this 512 bytes being reallocated each time this function gets called. Aside from the fact it would be inefficient, we'd lose our recording. But I also don't want to share it with the rest of the main program. So by putting it here and using the keyword static, this buffer will stay in memory but only accessible to this function. At our sample rate of 38 kilohertz, this buffer will get played approximately 75 times a second. So the maximum lag we could ever introduce is 1 75th of a second, which is about 13 milliseconds. Now we come to the re-pitching code. Instead of writing our recorded sample to port D directly, we'll write it to the array one byte at a time, incrementing the position each time. The AND511 ensures that when input position reaches 512, it loops back to zero. Now for the output, we need a simple way of changing the speed. Now we could use a floating point number, where 1 meant play at normal speed, 0.5 meant play at half speed, and 2 at double speed, for example. But on an embedded device like this one, we want to try and avoid using floating point numbers as much as possible, as they're horribly slow. So, instead, we're going to use a variable of type short, that's 2 bytes big. It has a maximum value of 65,035. But when we use it, we're going to do this strange shift right 7 places. That's the same as doing a divide by 128. Now there's something a little sneaky here. You'll notice I don't put any limits on the value of the output position variable. That's because we can just keep increasing it, and when it goes past 65,035, it can't store anymore, and it'll wrap back round to zero. And as 65,035 divided by 128 is 511, we can never go over the length of the array. On to the playback speed. I've declared this variable here, which we can use as our speed value. You'll notice this strange keyword volatile in front of it. This doesn't mean it's going to explode. It's a special word that informs the compiler that it can't make some of the usual optimizations about the value. Consider this code. It's very simple. We increase a variable A by variable B. Now, to do this, the compiler will generate code that looks up the memory location for B, copies the value from that location into a register, looks up the memory location for variable A, finds the value, copies that to another register, then adds the two registers together, then writes the result back to the memory location for variable A again. Sounds quite complex, but the compiler will make a few speed optimizations here. If it knows the value of B isn't going to change here, then it will only read from the memory location once, and keep reusing this register. 
Now imagine this code got interrupted and the value of b changed. Well, the compiler can't understand this and so can't account for it, so we have to help it. The volatile keyword tells the compiler not to optimise access to this variable and every time it's needed to read it back from RAM. This is a little bit slower to execute, but without doing this, changing the value of B could get ignored. To make the audio play at normal speed, we need to preset the playback speed to 128. To double the speed, we'd set the playback to 255, and to half it, we'd set it to 64. First, I'll program it with 128 so you can hear the normal sound. And now with a value of 90. And now with a value of 150. Great! So all that theory works, but it's a little inconvenient to be setting values and reprogramming the Arduino each time, so we need to find a better way of controlling this. Now we could just add two buttons, one for increase and one for decrease, but that's a little clumsy and boring. Some of you will have instantly thought about adding a variable resistor between 5 volts and ground that we could sample and then use that to change the playback speed. Well unfortunately we can't do this. We've reprogrammed the Arduino's analog to digital converter to continuously sample A5 exclusively. If we want to read a different pin, first we'd have to reprogram it, but this would interrupt the audio while we did this and we don't want that to happen. So instead, I'm going to use one of these. It's called a shaft or rotary encoder. It turns just like a variable resistor except that you can just keep turning it in any direction for as long as you like. So let's have a look how it works. If you look more closely at the shaft encoder, you'll notice it has five pins, an input voltage, ground, and three outputs. The output labeled SW is just a simple switch. If you push the knob down, you'll hear a little click. It's just a simple button. The other two are more interesting. As you rotate the shaft, you can feel it clicking into grooves. It's not smooth like a variable resistor, and this is how it works. As you turn the shaft, the two clock and data lines change value between the input voltage and ground, but not at the same time. When a change occurs, we know that it's been turned, but by looking at the sequence they change in, we can determine the direction. Here's the two signals, and as you can see, one is offset from the other. Using this, if you turn the shaft clockwise, clock will go high before data, and if you turn the shaft anti-clockwise, data will go high before clock. So I'm going to connect it to the Arduino like this, and the code to use this is surprisingly simple. First we declare the inputs for the three pins, then we monitor the state of the clock line, and only when it changes do we want to do something. After a change, we take a look at the data line. If the state of the data line matches the clock line, then we know we've gone anti-clockwise. If the data line doesn't match the clock line, then we know we've gone clockwise. With this in mind, we can just change the value of our speed. I've also added detection for the button press to reset the playback speed to normal. I guess all that's left to do is test it as I talk to you. Now I did promise sounding like a chipmunk, right? Okay, so now you can hear the audio coming from the Arduino. Here goes. While I test this, why not click the subscribe button so you can see more videos like this? And if you want to, consider supporting me on Patreon too. Ooh. Well that seems to work well. How about some music? works well. It's not the best audio quality in the world, but that could be improved by switching to a faster device and sampling in 16-bit. There's also other techniques you could look at to smooth out the clicks as you change the playback speed, but I'll leave that up to you to discover. Are we doing a follow-up video soon? So click that notification bell to make sure you don't miss it. I hope you found this interesting, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.